church, we set up some musical instruments on the stage now, so you may feel you are here at HBC. So worship with us together. So yeah. So no matter what we are facing now, I believe all of us, each one of us, want to praise to praise and worship God, because we know God, His generous and His love. And he provides everything what we need. So, um, why don't you just take a time, or take a moment to think about his love and his grace? So, yeah.
Stop singing your praises because we know your God, we know your Savior, your Father, and your friend. Your love, your grace s a t i s f y our soul, everything. So, you're everything to us, Lord God. No one compared to you, Lord God. Nothing compared to your love. So, we know that. That's why. You are keep singing your love, your grace, and your name. No matter what you are facing right now, because of your love bigger than everything, greater than anything, we you know that you are holding it. So God, thank you. You are thank you, Lord God. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay, hi. Good morning, everyone. So we are into the last week of this series, and I hope you're doing fine in your lockdown at your home. But right now, we are all released. That they have a chance to get some. Uh, Relationship or at least some connection with people. Uh, remember, just a, a review of a little bit about the uh, last few weeks. So you have heard about uh, the first message uh, on rule relationships. Okay, about rules, the different rules. We have also talked about, talk about three relationships that we have with each other, and also with God. And then you also have heard about the real relationship. What is real? How do you know it's a real, genuine relationship? Should be. Then just last week we talk about relation slips. Yes, yeah, the ways, the easy temptation that can cause us to slip and then fall. But today we're going to look at relation shifts. Okay. But before we begin, maybe we should to uh, turn to God again. Um, all understanding and then all the words God going to speak to us is actually not about um, what I can say. It's basically I'm just a messenger, so I believe God is going to be able to speak to you and be able to talk to you personally, and help you to realize uh, what Jesus or the Word of God is saying. So let's turn to Him in prayer and see. Okay, so take a moment right now, uh, humble yourself, and ask God to uh, give you um, a quiet heart, and also ask the invite the Holy Spirit to guide you to talk, and you can pray for me too. So that I can be found faithful as a messenger to uh, deliver his uh, message. Father, we come together in to you and together as we worship you this Sunday and this morning as we come together, we reveal uh, some of the words that you have spoken to us regarding relationship, and we submit ourselves right now, uh, humbling ourselves because what we know, we are very weak, easily tempted, and has been always selfish, looking always. Uh, God into our s e l f only. So Lord, cause a shift now, cause a change in our direction, so that we begin to be able to uh, do what you have always asked us and wanted us to do, and what you created us. So right now, speak to us, and I invite the Holy Spirit right now to fill my heart and uh, and put words that are uh, required to be spoken, and let no um, selfish words come from myself, but rather you yourself will be the one that deliver the message. So God, use me as a vessel, and I pray, and we all pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, we're going to talk about relation shifts. Okay, 
And if you have been driving, I guess you know what is the shifting of the gears is. But I uh, mind you, sometimes we have been running our car on the reverse. So that means reverse in a sense that we, we are following uh, the standard of the world. So you have been running reverse, so it's going to destroy and spoil your engine anyway. So if that's the so and that's the case, then we need to shift to uh, run forward. And if you have been running forward, then I think it's also need to shift a little bit so that you can move a little bit faster into the Word of God, move faster and let God work through you. So before we do that, uh, let's read a passage here. No? And uh, this passage is taken from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. No? And uh, it's about Paul. Uh, Paul is talking about uh, uh, he being the master builder. So let's read that, okay? So we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So uh, let me read with you. It says, According to the remarkable grace of God, which was given to me to prepare me for my task, like a skillful master builder, I lay a foundation, and now another is building on it. But each one must be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. But if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will be clearly shown for what it is. For the day of judgment will disclose it, because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality and character and worth of each person's work. If any person's work which he has built on this foundation, that is, any outcome of his effort, remains and survive this test, he will receive a reward. But if any person's work is burned out by the test, he will suffer loss of his reward. Yet he himself will be saved, but only as one who has barely escaped through fire. Do you not know and understand that you, the church, are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells permanently in you, collectively and individually? If anyone destroys the temple of God, corrupting it with false doctrine, God will destroy the destroyer. For the temple of God is holy, sacred, and that is what you are. Wow. So you see here in this passage, very simple, we are talking about relationship. But here Paul says, and then if you look the full, at the full chapter on the uh, third, uh, third chapter of uh, First Corinthians, you realize he's talking about there are Christians who are acting like babies. I mean, they, they are not actually uh, maturing, even though they have been years in the church or years in the following. So he's addressing that, and then there were dissensions. Uh, people say, I belong to this group, I belong to that group. So he, he deals with that, and then Paul then finally comes to this part, which I felt is very vital because many a times we don't touch a lot on this part. He said, you and I, every one of us, is a building. He said, here, yeah, God has laid a foundation. That Paul said, I lay a foundation, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. And no one else can build upon it, I mean, lay a different foundation. For our foundation is in Christ, but then our lives is building up, building up to be a temple. So that means uh, they are laying bricks on it, materials. So that's why in the passage he talked about uh, gold, silver. There are different types of materials and all these things we are laying onto this foundation. So each of you, you, me, and every one of us has a foundation. So you are building your temple which house the Spirit of God. So you are laying out uh, materials on that. Not just you lay on it, but other, spe other people are laying on you. So in other words, when I say something to you, or when and another person says something or encouraging words to you, they are laying another piece of material into your life. So it's building up your temple, actually. So that's why it's asks us to be careful. Because we are doing things, and we are connecting with people, we are talking, we are uh, helping. You know, all these are laying something into each other's life. And one day, all this will be tested. But if we are not careful, we are just wasting time or not really careful about building something or putting materials that has eternal value, then the test will come, the fire will test whether the quality or the character or the worth of that material or the person's work will actually survive the fire's test. Then eventually it will burn up. But if it is going to survive, then wow, the scriptures say, according to Paul, he, say, he says that you will be rewarded. So you will be rewarded. So it's not just 
sidetrack a little bit here. Heaven is not a reward, remember that. Okay? Heaven is not a reward. Heaven is totally a free gift. That means it's based on grace God gave to you. But what is there you're going to bring up there or what you're going to receive when you are up there in heaven, that is reward. And that is dependent on what you are doing down here on earth because you are doing something, laying up some materials in somebody's life, or just laying up on your own life, or your own foundation, but eventually it will be tested. And the scriptures say, wow, it say, once you tested the, the, through fire, it say, he will receive a reward if it remains, but he will suffer loss. In other words, to say that we will lose all the reward that were supposedly yours or mine if we didn't grab hold of the opportunity to lay some good materials in each other's life. So that's why when we come into this series of relationship, and you've been hearing in the past uh, four messages, so those are vital. That helps you because you are laying into somebody's life who will bring your materials up to heaven. But whether you're laying good stuff into that person's life depends on what you're doing or what you have been doing and what you will be doing from this point onwards. So that's why we have to be careful. Have you ever wondered, asked the question, no, why did God create us? Mm -hmm. Is he too free, nothing to do? Or he's feeling boring? So why did he create us? So there's been a reason. And you also realize that when he created us, he must have a purpose. And if you take note seriously and look carefully, right in the beginning, the first ch uh, chapter in the Bible, okay, it says we were created in God's image. You know? So you and I were created in God's image. So if we were created in God's image, and if God is love by his nature, it's love, that means I and you and everyone should have that image of love. That means you and I and every one of us are capable to love, capable to express love, capable to really show the kind of love as expressed by our Lord Jesus Christ too. So that's why you will realize that I think and I believe very strongly that God created us in His image and He created us to love. Love is always a free will choice cannot be forced. That means there can be a choice to love or a choice not to love, to freely give off oneself to another or hold back and reserve uh, not to give at all. So that must have the choice of, uh, uh, of loving. So love has a high price actually. So that is like a, uh, you're not going to share, you're not sure when you express love to a person, that person is going to return or, or receive it well or return it. So that is relationship. So what, what kind of a love relationship God is uh, talking about here? I believe you have heard many times, especially when I preach, I talk about the disciple cross. You know? If you still remember the cross, you know, the cross, you know, there's uh, two bonds here. There's a vertical relationship between man and God, then me and God, okay? And then there is a horizontal relationship between uh, people, you know? people around me, people who believe and people who does not believe, you know? people who don't believe at all. So, so, so that is the part where you and I can express. We are made to love, so to love God and to love people. Let's look at this uh, verse here in Deuteronomy chapter 10. So what does the Lord your God require from you? Stop there. Think carefully. Now, you, you might say he's speaking to the Israelites now, talking about the Jews. No, 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 I think it applies to everyone. And we have the roots of Abraham. So we are also you know, grafted into Abraham's root. That means some of the, I mean, the, the instruction given to them also applies to us. So what does the Lord your God require from you? Have a good life. Get all the things you can accumulate, enjoy it, you know. No, no it's really very clear right here, right at the beginning, you know, in, in uh, Moses' book here, you know. He said, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear and worship the Lord your God with all fear, reverence, and profound respect, you know. He is the creator. So you must have the kind of fear and worship and respect and the kind of uh, worship to the one who made you and I. You cannot take him for granted, take him like a, like a, you know, if I believe or if I like to, then I get close to him. No, you're talking about the creator of this universe. And they say to walk, that is to live each and every day in all his ways and to love him 
and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, your choices, your thoughts, your whole being, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and His statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. So has God not asked that of us too? So to love is actually primary to our existence, actually. But you, as you can see, you know, uh, the world has loved something else. The, love, the world loves material things now. The world loves uh, actually everything about themselves rather than the one who made them. So we have to be careful and realize this is actually not what we were created. But there is always a choice, a choice to do so to follow what the Creator has instructed and the reason why he has made us and gave us all these instructions or commandments so that we know how to live to the fullest of his design or there is always a choice to say no i want to live my own life so that's why the very basis the very basis and command right in the old testament they said to love god and love people that means love my neighbors is actually fundamental to our relationship so it, in other part, Jesus said this, and he said this as he gave us this command. Now in John chapter 13, verse 34 then, to 35, he said, I am giving you a new commandment. Hold it there. What, what do you mean? Is there something new here? But it's not really new. It's an old, but it's not new at all. But he put it and said, this summarizes all the commands of the Old Testament. This actually puts together, and if you obey this, you are obeying all the commands actually in the Old Testament. So he said, I'm giving you a, com a summary, a new commandment that you should love one another. He said, just as I have loved you, that means to the same degree, to the same standard, to the same uh, sacrificial uh, love that he has for us, that with that same, same standard, you are also to love one another. That means we want to love each other, brothers. Wow, that is very heavy stuff here. We are not talking about just a hi, bye, that kind of love or concern. It's really good to the point. You say, hey, do you need me to the point? I need to go to the cross and die for you. And that is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus loved us. Not just as I have loved you, this is how Jesus has loved you. This is how he has loved me. To the point, he go to the cross and die. So it goes back to me to say, am I going to go to the cross to die to show the kind of love for one another? Every brothers and sisters here and others. And then he carried on to say here, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have love and unselfishly concern for one another. Wow, you look at this, this is heavy stuff. You know, you say, this is a mark, a mark of a really, truly genuine, born again disciple of Christ. We are not talking about those by name or just go to church because you just want to show their presence there. But we are talking about a real transformation in the person's life to come to the point to be able to love as the same degree as, as Christ has loved us. I can confess to you directly and quickly, even right now, I am not there yet. I am far from there now. To be able to love sacrificially unconditionally to love beyond the core of requirement or duty to love to the point of giving up one's life or another that i am still far and i'm learning i have to admit that i'm not there but i'm learning and i'm going to invite you to do the same and not fool around and play around at jesus command here no this is a commandment this is not a request this is not even a suggestion this is absolute it's an order just like a command i give you an order like a military you go and fulfill your order and come and report to him see that is the kind of command a new commandment i'm giving to you and that command is to ask you to love one another even to the point requiring you to die to yourself when you start thinking about how am i going to die am i going to jump off and die and what, what would you mean? But Jesus did speak something about that. I have talked about that before. And that is where we carry our cross daily. When you and I, who say we follow Christ, He say, let us now deny ourselves, deny our ambition, deny our self-interest, deny our selfish dreams, and all these things we like to pursue and care for our own convenience and comfort and at our most, at our, you no. Know, that means I put it this way, move away, shift gear from ourselves, now shift it gear to others. 
to love others just as He has commanded us. Now I have to shift gear from loving myself, caring about myself. Then I have to start caring about others, love about uh, uh, love others. So that is a proof. You say that is how people know you and I are His disciples, unselfishly His disciples. You see, loving God and loving people, the very basic foundation to love is actually to be able to love God. Because once you're able to start loving God, then that forms the foundation for your relationships. No? Loving God, you say, once you be you're loving God, you'll find that strength, that is source of love. Because God is love. When I love God, there is a return of God's love falling back on me. Then that's where I draw the source of love to be able to start loving people. But if I were to dig from my own well here, I'll find that my bank, my well here is actually empty. You know? So I can only, like, okay, I will be patient for once, for twice, for three times. But but not the fourth time. So you see, oh, I, I, so there is a limit to where I can dig out the source of love, the energy to love. But I must plug myself, plug myself into my, our loving God, our God who is so loving, who is so generous and merciful, or abounding in mercy. I must draw myself to Him to let that channel in the love so that I become a vessel. It's like a tube or like a like a pipeline then flows into me and through me and pass on to others then i find that strength to love my neighbors and others just as he has commanded me to do so to do that i must really learn to obey what he has said because when i and you and every one of us are willing to obey then we are actually beginning to express the love we have for god look at this verse here uh, John chapter 14, uh, Jesus said there. Yeah. Now I'm going to touch on from here on, mostly uh, from the words of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, you know, our God, our Creator. You know? So all His words here, I'm going to draw from all these words from His words to help us to realize and see what He has said about loving uh, God, especially we're talking about relationship and loving people. You know? So look at this, uh, John chapter 14 here, verse 15. He said, if you really love me, okay, you will keep and obey my commandments. Wow, it's not so much about a feeling here. He's talking about an action, an obedience. That means to keep what he has said or ask and do what he has asked us to do. He say, if you really love me, you will keep and obey my commandments. And he goes on to say, the person who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who really loves me. And whoever really loves me will be loved by my Father. I will be loved by my Father, my Heavenly Father. And then he say what Jesus said, And I will love him and reveal myself to him, and I will make myself real to him. Wow, that is, that is how the connection comes. I must start by obeying his word. What he say, I obey. He tells me to do that, I do that. He do this, I do this. Rather than just playing around in my mind, yeah, I love God, I love God in my mind. Yes, if you love me, show me. Okay, if you love me, show it. Do not just have it. So, how am I going to do that? How am I going to be doers of the word? No, how am I going to really let the love express and really be found myself in God's love? Now, if you have kept my commandments, you will abide in my love. Jesus said that, and just as I kept my Father's commandment and abide in His love. You and I, and every one of us who say and claims that we are following Christ or claims that we are Christian. Or disciples, we must learn to abide you know, in the Father's love. And to do that, we need to look into these words and obey what He say. Now, you have often heard about the golden rule. You know, the golden rule. The golden rule that says now, uh, in here in the NIV version, they say, So in everything, do to others what you will have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. In the Amplified Version, put it this way. say, in everything, Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. But you look at today's lifestyle has changed so much. Our lifestyle, you say, I don't care about that anymore. I just make sure I care for myself. I make sure I have enough for myself. I just accumulate enough. I have a lot of resource, re, uh, reserve just for myself or for my family. That's good enough. Then the rest is when I'm convenient, when I have time, then I will think about it. Or when I have extra, I have a lot more than extra I can use, then I will use that. This is 
practice. It's absolutely realized these words is not much practice today. Not the golden rule of uh, what Jesus is saying here. It's to treat others the same way you want them to be treated. So how has this world has changed, you see? I know I'm going to look if you, if you have time, you'll take a look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, it is a very rare situation that we at this generation are able to witness all the things that is said in the third chapter of 2 Timothy regarding the kind of people that we have today and regarding what is happening. It's like, what well, I'm reading history, not history, I'm reading live news here today in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said that, but understand this, not Paul wrote here, understand this, that in the last days, dangerous times of great stress and trouble will come, difficult days that will be hard to bear. Listen carefully, he said, for people will be lovers of self. Mm -hmm. You see that? So they are self-focused or lovers of money, you know, they are impelled by greed, you know, boastful, arrogant, you no, know? revilers, disobedient to parents. I mean, you know, watching that today also in, uh, in almost many of our uh, families and uh, people we know. And then we say ungrateful, no grateful, not even grateful to the things we have done for them. No, unholy and profane as they will be, you know, they will be unloving, they don't care about it have no human affection, no? inconsolable, that means they are not able to restore friendship, no? they just cut off and that's it, malicious courtships, no? uh, devoid of self-control, they just couldn't control themselves, no? brutal, haters of good, traitors, reckless, conceited, you know? lovers of sexual pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form outward godliness or religion, although they have denied his power, for their conduct nullifies their claim of faith. And you see that? No, they go on to describe and say, the people will be always learning and listening to anyone who will teach, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. They're not able to put the truth into practice. So how can we as a church family, as a brothers and sisters, how can we really turn this around? Or are, are we going to just accept this? Or is this actually happening in your life or in your family or in your workplace? Then let me just share with you very quickly here. I usually do that as I mentioned about the disciple cross. You know? There's one relationship here. The first most fundamental relationship is to love God. So love God it means to have the, the ability, have the, 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 uh, the desire and time to be with Him, to talk about things and let Him talk to us through the world. So this is where they go. But today we are talking more on the horizontal relationship, horizontal relationship in terms of people. So we have two groups of people here, no? One who could be eternally with God and the other one who is going to be eternally away from God. So just basically two groups, even though there are so many different races and, and culture or geographical or in, even, I mean, but then it falls into two groups basically. So we're going to look at this part only, this part about relationship with family, the family, the eternal family of God. We call that, uh, the brothers and sisters, all in other words, we call it the church. And then if we have time in the future, we will talk about the friends. The friends who chose and uh, have not come to know Jesus Christ. And if they do not come to know Jesus Christ, these friends of ours or people we know in contact, they will be eternally away from God. God cannot force them. God cannot do anything against their will. But God will let them be away. You know? So, but let's look at this part, family. And I and I and I, and I like to look at uh, the church family from the family viewpoint. You know, because when remember when Jesus, uh, the disciple asked Jesus to teach us to pray. Remember that. The Lord's Prayer, I talked about it a, a few weeks ago. I uh, talked about the Lord's Prayer, uh, I think more than a few words. Remember that? Jesus replied and started off with what? This is how you pray. And then he started off with our Father. So as long as you start off with Father, Jesus is trying to tell us, now we are talking about family. So where there's a father, there are children. So when there, are, there is a father, there is actually brothers and sisters in the family. They are talking about actually now the eternal family, the, the Christian family. And very interestingly, if you notice, when Jesus taught us how to pray, he said, our, he didn't say, go ahead and say, my father. If it is all oh, my father, it will be very individual. It's very basically, it's all about me, you know, me, me, my, my, all that. But he's talking about we, our father. That means our, you and I, we, 
belonging to this family. So the church actually should function and we are functioning as a family. We should never function as a corporation or like a business or like a, a no, no, it has to be a family because this is the family of God. So with that, I'm going to use the acronyms of what a lovely, uh, 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 God's loving family would be like. You know? Now first, before we get into it, you can see a big difference between family and corporation or clubs. That's a big difference, right? Family and clubs, okay, or corporation is different, definitely different, you know? If corporation, they squeeze everything out of you, whether you like it or not, and you, they own you rather than you actually and, and they part, and then they give you a small little reward and you'll be happy for the whole month until the next month again. So that is not about a family. We're talking about family. Family requires each person to play a part, whether it be the brother, elder brother, or sister, young. Everybody plays their part. Then only then when we continue to give towards the family, only then can there will be a beneficial functioning family. Otherwise, everybody just do and stay in their room and don't care less except to come out to eat when the time is up. Then this is really a dysfunctional family. That means if only when it's time to worship, everybody comes back to church and worship. Or we get online and then, and then other than that, we have no connection, no talk, no nothing. You do your thing, they do their thing, and we do our thing. Then it is a dysfunctioning family. So here, we're going to see the big difference here. It's not a club, not something you can uh, ask, what can I get out of it? But rather as a family, what you are going to give to a seed. Family requires each member to give to a step in order to have a functional family. But if everyone is trying to throw something out like a club, you know, or a, a movie theater and throw something out or a hotel, then this family is dysfunctional. This church will be dysfunctional. So we're going to look at what Jesus has said regarding this family, but definitely has spoken a lot. But I'm going to use a few acronyms to help us to remember with the words family, F-A-M-I-L-Y. And then obviously it's not comprehensive, but it's good enough to help us to get started as a church family, a family of believers. So here, starting with uh, F, what would that be? The most fundamental, the first thing F, I guess you have, uh, what words you will have guessed? Uh -huh. Yeah, forgive. In every family, there must be forgiveness. A godly family, a godly family that loves God must forgive. There's no exception here. Look at these words here. If you forgive others their transpasses, their reckless and willful sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, nurturing your hurt and anger with the result that it will interfere with your relationship with God, then your Father will not forgive your transpasses. This is heavy stuff. Put it in a very simple manner. You don't forgive your brother and sister. You don't forgive people, others. That means you're asking God not to forgive you. So if God, you're asking God not to forgive you, what does it mean? It means that you're not going to be with God. You actually does not displace a child of God. So that's why you say, you're asking God not to forgive you? Come on. Jesus died for us so that we can be forgiven as pay. So we must now, who have received this forgiveness, now we should be freely forgive others. It doesn't matter, matter how many times, no? Uh, we need to forgive, we still need to forgive even though he keep, or she keeps repeating the same old thing, no? Year after year, every year, still the same old mistake, asking for your forgiveness. Just like here, Peter once asked, no? Jesus said, how many times will my brother sin against me and I forgive him and let it go? Up to seven times, Jesus answered him. I say to you, not up to seven times, but seventy times. Seventy. In other words, put this together. Forgive until you meet up in heaven. Yep, forgive and keep forgiving. So you will see that the first thing is say forgive. And then in fact it will hamper, it will it will the main stumbling block will be uh, actually causing you to stumble, causing you to be not able to worship. Here again, Jesus saying here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, he's saying, so if you were presenting your offerings at the altar, and while then you remember that your brother has something such as a grievance or legitimate complaint against you, he's saying what? Leave your offering there at the altar and go. First, make peace with your brother, and then come and present your offerings. So the first fundamental of actually in the family is being able to forgive one another despite of how bad it is or how many times he has re repeated that. Just forgive. On the basis God has forgiven you. And also to be reminded that 
God has forgiven that brother who also have turned to God for forgiveness. So it is actually not so much about your relationship with the brother of uh, whether you are able to forgive or strengthen. It's more so now your relationship with God because if I don't forgive him, I'm telling God, don't forgive me. So in other words, God cannot forgive you. Oh, that is, I don't want to be in such a position. I want God to be always merciful to me, to forgive me because I sin. I keep sinning every day. I have thoughts or maybe an anger or burst or, or my words or choice of word, my tone. Actually, actually sinning against God, actually, because of the way I talk to people and I need that kind of forgiveness. So start that as a family, forgive. So you need to take time to ask God for strength to forgive, no? Your own strength, my own strength, would not be able to. We have no reason to forgive, actually. But if we draw from ourselves, no reason. But if we draw from God, we have every reason. Because we were first forgiven. And then now we can forgive others. Because he or she, too, is created in God's image. So I must not defile that image. I must not cause that problem. Okay, then, uh, now we come to the second one. Is A. What do you think would that be? Uh -huh. I guess many of you will not be able to guess A because this is something we seldom do in church and then uh, especially in the modern culture and right now many a times is we say uh, we keep to our own business you know? uh, that is your uh, not my part I mean that's not my responsibility no in a family everyone in the family is responsible that means I have responsibility over to my younger brothers or younger sisters so if they are not doing right or not doing correct I must correct them so I need to have that responsibility and that leads to the second one is called ammonitious so ammonitious that means to be to come to the point I need to have to correct them if they are wrong look at the uh, let's take a look at Jesus words here in Matthew chapter 18 uh, verse 15 say if your brother sins if your brother sins Wow, many a times you say, oh no, who am I to judge? And I don't want to get involved with that. that I leave it to him and I let him, him and God, so I have no part. So that is not a family, you know. That is a, it's like a, it's a club. It's a club whereby, okay, when a, a member is not doing right, a member is not, uh, the club member is actually not doing uh, what he's supposed to be doing. We have no part. Say, I don't want to, I mind my own business. I don't want to interfere. Don't let the management deal with that. So that is not a family. In a family, it's different. In a family, that means as long as you are mature and you recognize the, the part of your brother or your sister uh, that is uh, need to be corrected, then you help them. Not judging. It's not judging. It's actually helping the person to come to realize where he has gone wrong according to the scripture. So let's look at this part. I say, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens and pays attention to you, you have one back your brother. See, so you have, you have the responsibility to show him according to the word of God where he has gone wrong or where he's not doing. So it could be like uh, having an affair or maybe he's uh, not uh, speaking the truth or maybe. So not that we are judging. It's just simply the Bible says this is not right. You're breaking the Ten Commandments. You're breaking the word of God. You're breaking what Jesus said regarding the family. So I need to help him to realize and let the Holy Spirit convict him of his wrong. But who is going to be the messenger? Who is going to be the one that actually shows him? So that's why Jesus say, you and I should show him his fault in private. If he listens, then pays attention to you, you have won back your brother. But if he does not listen, take along with you one or two more uh, to others, so that everyone may be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So others come along. Not to make the blow up the case, it's just to build up the uh, the uh, the um, what do you call it? Build, build up the the uh, perspective of the situation from different viewpoint. So we have the responsibility to help the person to come. Say so if he pays no attention to them, refusing to listen and obey, then you tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a gentile unbeliever and a tax collector. In other words, to say, this brother, if he keeps on sinning, it is questionable in the first place this brother actually has been transformed or actually has been born again. So we need to share the gospel to him just like an unbeliever because he keeps repeating the sin. Because the Bible says, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you will not have the desire to do that. You, he will transform you and change you. So that's what we are supposed to help him. So admonish uh, each other or when you see a wrong, 
child is a very difficult situation. So in a church situation, just like that, when you see a children, I mean, in the children ministry, sometimes you see the kid running and that he's uh, doing something that's not right or cracking or whatever. So we as an adult, as part of this family, we have a responsibility to say, hey, uh, this is not right. They have to correct. It's not like, oh, who am I to judge your, your uh, son? No, no, it's not basically that because we are family. So as a family, we must care for each other and correct each other when there is not right. So the, that's the second part. Very difficult to do it. And this is a culture we need to start doing because I don't see this culture happening much in our hillside family here. So that's why we need to start this culture. Because I know I remember when I was in my time, we have brothers and sisters correcting me, also telling me where I've gone wrong. Or even we have a responsibility for other uh, parents' children. We actually care for them. And the youth, we correct them. So we correct each other. So that means it's a big family that cares and actually corrects. Then the third thing is that I guess you have known it, um, it's not too difficult. As a family, they must have time to meet together. So uh, families always meet together. So they meet together uh, for meal, okay, for time of fellowship, times of gathering. So they must have time. So when we are always locked into a room, you, you go back home, your kids are always in the room and never shows up, no? And then when they're hungry, you just go to the fridge or go to get their food and then go back to the room. Is that a functioning family? No, that is really a dysfunctioning uh, family. So as a family of God, our God here is actually we need to take time, time to show care, concern, encourage, fellowship with one another. Now listen to this uh, part when Jesus say this. He say in Matthew chapter 18, uh, 18 verse 19, he say, Again, I say to you that if two, bro uh, two believers on earth agree, that is, uh, of one mind in harmony, about anything they ask within the will of God, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Listen carefully here. I say, where two or three are gathered in my name, meeting together as my followers, I am there among them. That means there is a meeting up. I mean, the, there's the smallest number you can get together is two. Yeah, you need two person to, to actually relate. You cannot relate by yourself. You cannot relate yourself. So you need to have two or three get together. No? So that's why even at this point of time, a lot of us are not able to come together as a big group. I think that's a positive side of it. Now we have to break up into smaller groups. No, Get on your WhatsApp, another two or three, just get together online, talk to each other, share to each other, agree together and ask of God together. He say, if you agree, Two of you agree upon what you ask according to the will of God, it will be done by my Father in heaven. So that's why the meeting up is very necessary. You know? And for, uh, just to let you know, by that way, when we get up to heaven, we'll be meeting each other a lot. So if you cannot get used to getting along and getting and meeting up with people down here, how do you expect to get along eternally up there? You know? So don't assume. So this is the preparation time of helping us to really learn to get along with each other, meet up together, pray together, uh, and then gather you know, together. You know? So that leads us to the fourth part, the fourth point here, that is to intercede. So when you get together, don't just talk about uh, everything under the sun except God, except His Word, except each other's needs. You talk about the news. No, 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 talk about and share needs together and then you can pray together. And one good example is that Jesus actually taught us how to pray. Remember the pattern? He said, pray then this way. And listen carefully, He said, our Father. You now you can't pray this prayer by yourself. You need to be together to pray together so that we can say our Father, right? Two or three together when you pray, so we can say our Father because we are here. So Jesus stressed a lot about the togetherness here, being together, praying for each other. And he gave a very good, uh, he actually showed us the pattern, uh, the how to pray. And then I believe um, uh, um, some messages ago, we have talked about that. Uh, half of it talk about uh, who you're talking to, and then the other half is who is asking. No? So who is actually listening and who is asking. And when you realize that, then you realize that when we ask, you actually are in line with God's uh, will. So pray together, talk together. I'm very glad. And then I guess you, you are doing it, many of you, is you share uh, prayer needs to, uh, to each other through the WhatsApp. So that is where you, you can pray together and then agree together. Then move on to the next one is the fourth. No family. Uh, F, you refresh a little bit. No F for forgiveness. A for harmonious. And then M for meets together. And then I for intercedes together. And then now we need to love together. We can love each other. No? 
And love many a times is not feelings, no. And in fact, is a I believe the attitude of love must be there. I know Paul uh, has clearly said in First Corinthians chapter 13, you, know, you must have the proper attitude, you must have genuine attitude to love. You cannot just say, I do this for you, but I'm not really loving it. But there must have a, a genuine attitude, a genuine character of love. But express in action. Love must be always in action. No? You look at this, uh, Jesus was talking about a uh, parable. No? He's talking about uh, separating the sheep uh, from the uh, uh, the goats here, and he say, he said, look, and then uh, after talking there a few verses before that on the twenty fifth chapter here, then goes on in verse thirty seven. He said, uh, he talk, goes on to tell this story, and uh, people responding, you no, know, when when uh, uh, the king was telling him, I was hungry, you know, you you fed me, and then uh, I was thirsty, you gave me a drink, and then the the people respond, and he respond to this king and say, Lord. When did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty, give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of these brothers of mine, even to, I mean, the, the least of them, you did it for me. And Jesus is trying to tell us here. Now, to express love to God, we express it to people around us. So when we feed or when we give somebody's thirsty and encouragement, help a person, even a stranger, you are doing to God because they are only in the image of God. They are actually loved by God too. So we cannot love God whom we cannot touch. But here you have people actually God say, when you do that to another person, you are doing it to him. So that's why it reminds us to really take advantage of the opportunity that's laid before you each day when you walk out from your home, you walk out everywhere. There's a lot of opportunity to express love, a gentle word of encouragement, a prayer in your heart for another person, or help out somebody who is in need, or give something that you can help out to. So all these are actually, in other words, Jesus say uh, in his own uh, uh, references, actually, laying up treasures in heaven. It's not laying up on earth here or collecting uh, for the earth, but in heaven. He says here, no, in, in um, the 10th chapter of Matthew, he said that, for and, and whoever gives to one of these little ones, uh, these are the humble in rank and influence, even, listen, even a cup of cold water to drink, because he is my disciple, truly I say to you, you will not lose your reward. So put it this way to say, that means everything you're doing out of love for another person to help, even as simple as a cup of cold water, you will be rewarded. Now that is a big difference. That's a reward you need to grab hold of the opportunity. So it's not like uh, you will get your reward if you do nothing down here on earth to help another, to show love to another. You will be actually going out there with nothing in your hand. So that's why you need to express, you and I, everyone need to express that uh, love in action to others. So that is love. So for the family. And then the last one, the last one is why. You know, F-A-M-I-L-Y, you know. Last part of a family, very simple, but not, as I say, not uh, comprehensive, but enough to help us to realize as a family how to function. And that is to learn to yield. Okay, it always yields, humble themselves and yield to each other. Jesus said this word, say, if anyone wants to be first, it must be last of all in, upon, in, in uh, importance and a servant of all. And then the same thing here in Matthew 20, uh, 20 verse 20, he says, whoever wishes to become great amongst you shall be your servant. Okay, so he if, I mean, we, we need to be a servant to each other. Jesus himself said, I come not to be served, but to serve. So if we are to imitate Christ, that means we must carry the attitude of humble ourselves down to serve another person. So consider others more important than ourselves. So in fact, Paul said, have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus, and that is to have selfless humility. So don't just merely look at your own interests, but look at the interests of others. There you go. You see, this is the uh, family. Forgiveness, admonishes, meets, intercedes, loves, and use. So how, how, how are we going to live our life? I think we need to put it into practice. We cannot just <clears throat> know it and not do it. Okay? 
So, so let's take a moment right now. As, as we, as a family, let's learn to really put things into practice. You know, the cross we carry, <coughs> really love our family. The family we're going to live eternally. And we need to start off with forgiving one another. And then admonishing one another. And then we need to also meet together with one another. Intercede for one another. We're going to love practically, you know. If somebody in need must share it, you know, and they're going to help their person. And we need to yield to consider others more important than ourselves. That is a shift of gear, a shifting of the self-interest to the interest of others. A shifting of focusing ourselves now, focusing on others. Because by doing so, we're expressing love to God. Because God, Jesus our Lord, actually say, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind and your strength. And then the second is this, that means you cannot go one without the other. No, first of all, love God. And when you love God, you need to express it by loving to people around us. And we have a good opportunity with family here. So love your family, not just your own family at home. I'm talking about the eternal family, the family of God, the brothers and sisters. As long as one who has Christ as Lord and a Savior for them, they are your brother and my brother and sister. And we need to love them. Love them just as Christ in the first place. I may told you the words, a new commandment I gave to you that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, then it's at the same level He has loved me. That is the same degree He expecting us to love each other and to love one another. So let's let us exercise real family, okay? Eternal family as instruction. All the verses you hear that you have heard so far is actually the word of God. So let us pray this one time. Close your eyes right now and pray. You know, this is your eternal family. I think we need to put this family a pretty high priority because this is a family going to meet eternally to the family of God. Forgive them. And if you, you see there's some wrong, we need to abolish them. Yes, not in your own power, but in the power of Jesus, the authority of Jesus Christ who has told us. We need to meet, we need to intercede, and to love practically with actions and we're going to yield to each other and we close it with these words from jesus christ he said no one has greater love nor stronger commitment than to lay down his own life for his friends and that is the word of jesus when we lay down our own self-interest for our brothers and sisters in christ in this family that's the greatest love just like jesus laid down his life for us Carry your cross daily and follow him. Let's pray. Make a prayer for yourself at this point. Maybe ask God for opportunity to express the kind of love you have for your eternal family, the family of God, even today and the days ahead. And ask God to give you that opportunity every day to show love so that you are actually sowing this in the treasure of yours in the heaven. Father, we thank you so much through the word of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, you have commanded us to love one another by this own man we know that we are disciples of Christ if we have love for one another. So Jesus, in our own strength, we can't make it. We always fail. We are selfish beings, sinful. But we thank you, Lord, we are forgiven. And that you on the cross have paid up for all of our debts so that we uh, righteous not of our own but of yours so now let this righteousness live in us so that we can live it out each day to love the others as you have loved us let teach us how to practice as family not just go and never consider this church as just a place where we come as a club to get something out of it but rather how we can give to us it to bring others so that we can present others perfect in Christ so help us and give us strength and thank you, Lord, that you've given us the Holy Spirit. Because through the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love. So I uh, be asked and uh, that each day, let that fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all this let it flow from us through your Spirit. So that your Spirit actually give us the strength to love. Thank you, Lord, for this reminder from the words of Jesus. Thank you again. In your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. So thank you brothers and sisters. So let's get started and love somebody today, no? Love somebody today.